I'm very proud to, uh, to be able to introduce our speaker today for several reasons. One is because he's a, a close, personal, longtime friend of mine, and, and I've, I've greatly appreciated his support and mentoring and, and just about everything else to help, us, help me move forward for over many, many years before I came to HRI and when I was with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And also because Pat uh, Murray, uh, is the president of the largest conservation organization in the country fishery, uh, from fisheries perspective, and it's, it's amazingly effective, the Coastal Conservation Association. I first uh, enjoyed uh, Pat's friendship and the support of CCA when I was uh, heading environmental and fisheries programs at Texas Parks and Wildlife, and, and it was a, uh, and that I came to admire and respect the organization because they really had my back in more than one situation. I remember uh, when I put out regulations or put together regulations to control shrimp farms and actually decided we couldn't get uh, the response we needed, so we rented a bulldozer and closed some shrimp farms by, by uh, bulldozing the outlet shut. It's always nice to do that when you have game wardens, the most heavily armed law enforcement people in the country behind you. It's not that difficult to deal. But there were times at that, that when uh, I had, that was the first time I had legislators, uh, legislators uh, tell me I should be fired. The second time, uh, well, there was many times, but the one I do remember, <laughs> the, one, the two that I remember mo most, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an ace in being fired, by the way, in the federal government. I've had at least five or six times the minimum, so I'm an ace in being threatened to be fired. Billy Causey and a few others, if we know about those kind of things. We've done that all our career. But uh, it's when I uh, felt it was important that we put a limit on the, the uh, commercial take of Menhaden in state waters. And, and that was a uh, that was a tough one. But you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, I couldn't, uh, wouldn't have never contemplated, wouldn't have had the guts to to have done those types of things, if I didn't know I had an organization behind me that would step up to the plate in any situation. As long as what we were doing was aimed at, at, uh, at fisheries and habitat protection in the state of, of Texas, they had our back and had my back. And so it was a great feeling to have one of the, the most, not one of the most powerful, uh, conservation organization in the state of Texas and around the country there. Uh, making sure that, that we did that we could do the right thing, and, and so I've, I've greatly appreciated that. What a lot of people don't recognize, and, and that's what I hope we accomplish here today with you all, if you're not familiar with them, that the recreational fisher, fisherman, angler, man or woman, and the organizations like CCA that represent them, are ex are some contribute more to conservation than just about any other group. More in both contributions in their time, their resources, their political clout, and their dollars. And they are an important part and should play an important part as we go forward in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's what I've asked Pat to come up here and talk with us about. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Pat Murray uh, to uh, the stage. Thank you very much. And thank you, Larry, for that glowing introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. It's a real pleasure and honor to speak to this group today. Um, what I'll do is I'll speak for a bit and then also entertain questions uh, afterward if you'd like. I heard about yesterday's speaker. Um, let's get clear right now, I'm not a general. I'm not gonna yell at you. And there'll be no calisthenics at any point. I'm gonna talk about recreational fishing. So it's a, a kinder, gentler approach today. Um, but I was thrilled to speak to this group, and particularly on this topic. Uh, when Larry had first approached me about speaking about recreational fishing and, and the impact it has on conservation, and particularly Gulf of Mexico conservation, um, it seemed like a real opportunity to get that across. And, and I know we have plenty of recreational anglers in the room, but you know what is interesting is I speak to groups throughout the country, what I often find is people don't necessarily inherently get the power of recreational angling. There's a passion there that's really hard to understand and maybe hard to describe unless you're a part of it. But that passion is what has led to some of the greatest conservation victories across the Gulf, is that recreational angler driving that effort. And there's a quote that I recently wrote about and I found myself using a number of times, um, it was not long after the Macondo, oil incident, and, and, and people would ask me at that time, what's going to make recreational anglers ever want to come back and fish in the Gulf? Well, there's a lot of reasons. But the one thing that I found myself referring to is this wonderful Scottish writer, John Buchan, and, uh, and his quote, the charm of fishing 
is that it's the pursuit of what is elusive but obtainable. And here's the key part. A perpetual series of occasions for hope. It perfectly captures recreational angling. But what it also captures, and that Buchan wasn't really speaking to, but somehow he managed to really um, get his hands around, was those occasions for hope don't just translate into bites and fish. It translates into incredible things that recreational anglers do to pro help protect the resource and perpetuate it. And what it is, is all of those moments when you're getting a chance to fish, when you see the things that you see when you're pursuing recreational angling, has that unending, dedicated attachment to the health of the resource. And be it you fish for a sailfish, or a red drum, or a speckled trout, one of my favorites. I mean, what's better than a speckled trout going after a topwater lure? Um, I mean, that, that's the thing that engages people for a lifetime. And we see that at Coastal Conservation Association is folks are so dedicated to the health of the resource. Well, there's many manifestations of that dedication. And what's interesting now in sort of the history of conservation is more and more we're seeing decision makers, um, political leaders start to get how this passion directly translates into economics. And these numbers you start to see from people fishing can very much influence the political process. You see, I, I, I played with a quote a little bit, but I think it's, it, it hits that point, is that, you know, indeed, you give a man a fish, he has food for a day, or maybe even for just a few minutes. Um, it's a tragedy we're not serving fish right now. Um, but you teach a man to fish, and he has to buy rods, reels, fishing tackle, everything else. That is a truism. And what that translates into is incredible numbers in, 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 in economics. And granted, this is an aggregate of, of all recreational fishing. These numbers are courtesy of the American Sport Fishing Association. But those are real numbers. That's a lot of economic output. And when you see that start to translate into 12 billion that anglers spend on boats and other gear, that's a lot of money. And that touches a lot of places in this economy. And so that's important. There's no doubt about that. But the, the, the point is, where does that lead to? And what we find is that you have that passion that translates into those economics, and lo and behold, you start to see recreational anglers pushing efforts that make a difference in the way our fisheries and our stocks are managed. This was 18 years ago in Florida. You don't see that now, but oh wait, just a few months ago, a judge upended a ruling and tried to reintroduce gill nets into Florida waters. And who were the first ones to that fight? Recreational anglers. And what was so fascinating is working with our group in Florida, our CCA group there, there were folks like Carl Wickstrom, who is the publisher of, of Florida Sportsman, and, and others there that were part of that original fight that rejoined again into this fight to make sure we didn't get this indiscriminate destructive gear back into those pristine waters. Those victories in Texas, in Louisiana, in Florida, and in other places were all led by recreational anglers who were that dedicated to making sure the resource was healthy. And one of the most amazing, this is not the Gulf, but um, is the effort in the Pacific Northwest. Those folks took the model that worked so well in the Gulf and are applying it in the Columbia River and have actually gotten a gill net ban in the main stem of the Columbia River. For those that are familiar with that area, to ban commercial gill netting there is almost unimaginable. It's been there for decades and decades and decades. And to get that to happen, there's only one thing that can make that happen. And it's really not money, and it's really not political influence, it's passion. It's that undying desire to make sure the resource is healthier tomorrow than it is today. And that's embodied best by the recreational angler. Um, you then see that start to translate into moving the political process. Here, President George Bush is signing an executive order to make red drum and striped bass a game fish in federal waters. That's pretty incredible. You think about two key recreational species to protect those, 
But who do you see standing behind him among the great luminaries? You see Walter Fondren, who was a chairman of Coastal Conservation Association. You see Dave Pfeiffer with Shimano, Mike Nussman with American Sport Fishing Association, recreational anglers. And you see a president there who's a recreational angler, making a difference in the future of these fisheries. This is a few little glimpses at Sea Center. Now, if you haven't been to the Sea Center hatchery, what a wonderful facility that is, and what a wonderful union that was of Dow, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and Coastal Conservation Association. And what that facility creates is not only millions of fish going back in bays, but cutting edge research and outreach to the public through their touch tanks and their aquariums and their, their wildlife centers where people can come who don't necessarily know a lot about the value of conservation and learn it hands on. So that community outreach begins to become a conveyor for that passion. And who knows who that engages in the future? This is the opening of CCA Texas's Larviculture Lab at University of Texas Marine Science Institute. Um, that's that next evolution. What's so fascinating about this facility is not only the science it's creating to help push forward the, uh, I think, so many fish stocks, but also the effectiveness of hatcheries and so much critical research. But when we opened that facility, when we raised the dollars for it, we said it was the lab that the anglers built. And the reason being is every dollar that went to build that lab came from CCA banquets. That lab was built in $100 bills. It was every raffle package and live auction item that I know some in this room have, have participated in, and God love you for that. And that's what built that lab. Well, if you think about what raised that dollar, was a recreational angler, joining a local chapter, going to the meetings, putting on the banquet, and effectively as volunteers raising dollars to build that lab. That's not every day that you get that kind of dedication to making a difference for the future of our fisheries. And that's what you see in recreational angling. That is a recent demonstration of putting um, southern flounder in Texas bays. The aggregate of all these different pieces, be it UTMSI's work on flounder or HRI's work on it, or or the Texas Parks and Wildlife's work on it, it all comes together and things that actually change the health of our bays. Now, the next evolution of that is habitat. That's the future, period. I'm telling you, that is the future of where recreational anglers and recreational-based conservation is going, is trying to enhance habitat. We spend more and more time every day with that. These are some pyramids that are going in near shore waters off of Texas. Um, to create critical snapper grouper habitat. Um, the work that we see volunteers all the time, and the, and the line is always hands dirty, feet wet. These are individuals getting out there and getting this stuff back into these, um, these estuaries and restoring critical marsh that's been lost for a zillion reasons and through a zillion years and making the oceans healthier. Be it a breakwater or be it a, a cutting edge um, uh, grass planting, these things are making a difference. Recently, um, through the incredibly generous help of Shale Oil Company, we created the Building Conservation Trust. Um, it is an entity that's sole function is to continue to enhance and restore critical habitat in the Gulf of Mexico and beyond, for that matter. And what we're doing is taking these core corporate dollars and just like the models that I showed earlier, be it a larviculture lab or hatchery or whatever it might be, and partnering them, where we start to bring together state agencies and we bring together corporate citizens and then we bring together individuals and recreational anglers themselves and all these different parts of the community to enhance the resource. Um, what we have found is be it a reef or be it a, a, a marsh, people can engage in it. And people sometimes that aren't even recreational anglers begin to engage on it. Our goal ultimately is have the person who's inland and never seen an ocean, who just wants healthy oceans to become a part of this because they too can make a difference in the health of our oceans. What's been impressive in this is that in the, in the, in the early years of it, um, we've been getting $2.70 for every $1 that Shell has put in there. And the reason being is, I'm gonna say that word again, it's passion. Because what we have is our volunteer grassroots folks are the ones that are reaching out and finding these incredible matches, finding folks that'll donate and match these key dollars. 
leveraging the dollars that the states have and turning those core corporate dollars into good conservation, good habitat restoration. This is a, just a quick glimpse at some of the projects that we've done. Um, I encourage you to go on CCA's website, joincca.org, and look at some of these projects as they manifest. Um, and, and some of them really are extremely cutting edge. Recently in 2013, um, the EPA gave Shell Oil Company the 2013 Gulf Guardian Award for the Floating Islands Project. Um, that's a statement on what this is doing. Number one, when was the last time the EPA gave an award to a, a large integrated oil and gas company? Um, but it shows how big this deal is, is that what this project essentially did was it took repurposed plastic and, and restored shorelines in Louisiana by putting marsh grass that would then grow to the, the bay bottom there, the, the marsh bottom, and begin to backfill it with silt and begin to reclaim some of those shorelines. Imagine the application of that in the future. And what we're seeing more and more in habitat restoration is that technology is finally catching up, where a lot of times it wasn't very effective at first. And now we're finding more and more application for it to continue to make the resource healthier. Um, you'll see right there, that is actually some of that floating island project being put together, where they're going across this eroded shoreline and recreating it. And then through time, it'll begin to backfill and backfill, and that marsh will be restored. And I think then, you can see I'm a guy that likes quotes, um, and you never ever fail quoting Teddy Roosevelt when you're talking about conservation, but really the end of that, that quote is, I think, touches the exact point with the great central task of leaving this land even better land for our descendants than it is for us. That's the kind of ethic you get with that occasion for hope. And I'm not knocking other user groups, but it's not an occasion to meet market price or not an occasion to make sure you hit your quota. And it's an occasion for hope. And that hope starts with catching a fish and that hope continues into restoring the resource and hoping that your child and your child's child and your child's child's child has the opportunity to catch a fish or maybe catch more than one fish. And that is the way recreational anglers continue to make a lasting impact on the future of particularly the Gulf of Mexico. That occasion for hope, and that's actually, that's the, you're about to get one at that point. That's not even an occasion for hope, that's an occasion to catch a fish. But the thing is, there were 100 casts before that, and the great thing is, there'll be 100 casts after that. And that occasion right there is the same reason that there's been 100 projects to date, and there's 1,000 more projects down the road, where recreational anglers will put that passion and that economic drive, and they'll channel it to ban gill nets and to create good fishing practices and to restore critical habitat and to make the oceans healthier tomorrow than they are today. That's what drives that occasion for hope and what makes, I think, the future so bright, particularly as we continue to enhance the role of recreational anglers and try to cultivate more and more recreational anglers. They're the stewards that will take us to the next level. So you can see, I have a lot of passion for recreational angling because I am a recreational angler, and I hope many in this room are as well. But with that, I wanted to open up for any questions, if anyone had anything that they wanted to address that I spoke about or anything even beyond that. See, not yelling helped. See, <laughs> people aren't afraid to ask questions now. Yes, sir. You know, that's a great question. The question is, are we present in Mexico or just the United States? We largely have been just present in the United States. Um, we have had some crossover, um, a little bit of stuff related to tarpon, some work that we did with uh, UTMSI, um, and then, of course, some of our work um, translates across, you know, just for funding various projects. But, uh, but sure would love the opportunity to, um, as we know that, you know, the Gulf is, is more than just those five states. Um, and so uh, it's, it's definitely a place to be. And the redfish that you all release end up down with us and then come back. Absolutely. No, absolutely. <laughs> that's one, one thing that's funny about fish, we've, we always said fish are the most political of all animals um, because they don't know borders, and those darn things swim. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of times they don't swim where you want them to because they swim into peril. So any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes.
Sure. I will tell you, I am not a believer in that. Um, the question was, are you, uh, how do you feel about protect? I'm a big believer in protecting uh, existing habitat, no doubt about that. Um, my goodness, there's so many things that we've done. Um, creating no fishing zones is usually, the, would be the effort of, of last measure. Um, no fishing zones, I, obviously there can be a time and a place. Um, you know, Dr. Earl and I have had conversations about this before. Um, I know there's, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, you're both on the advisory board. The retreats can get real spicy that way. Um, and, and, and I understand that. Uh, um, I mean, I, it, it would be silly for me not to say that I understand that. But, but my, one, of, one of my thoughts is always, um, you know, obviously we're fish first. Obviously we're conservation first. Um, and, and there's no doubt recreational anglers have an impact on the resource. But, but. I would have to have to say that in 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 that sort of global impact is that when we've gotten rid of bottom long lining and pelagic long lining and ocean trawling and so many of those practices and if we still have a significant problem there's no doubt the recreational angler needs to be scrutinized more and the recreational angler is already under significant bag limits and and seasonal restrictions and and all sorts of different measures to to further manage so Total exclusion zones are usually not something that I would subscribe to. Um, although I will say CCA has supported bottom closures um, in certain aggregation areas, for example, on overfish stocks. But I've never felt there should be a reason you couldn't troll in that area um, and, and catch a pelagic species that was perfectly healthy. So, but it's, it's a great question and it's a good healthy debate. It's something that I think we need to continue to always be open to discuss. One more quick question, One more quick question if anyone else. Oh, yes. from the smallest microbes to larger fishes like amberjack and grouper. They reside on these shipwrecks. And so I think having this discussion be between marine archaeologists, fisheries biologists, and anglers, I think there's a lot that we have in common in terms of protecting these resources. Because you know, while, while their value to me is more for the cultural, historical, mm -hmm. and archaeological value, there's obviously a value to you guys as well. So our, our resource supports and sustains your resource. Absolutely, because I mean, there's a huge biological impact from that, no doubt. That sustains so many parts of that, that, that those key fisheries and those key fish stocks, all the way from the base level. Okay, last one. Yes, I, I have to ask a question behind uh, Sylvia here. Uh, well, we're yeah, yeah. Um, I've, Sylvia and I have been friends since 69, but I spent 10 days locked in an underwater habitat with her, and she got inside my head. <laughs> Uh, uh, big time. But uh, I, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm a big supporter. I'm a recreational fisherman. My whole family are recreational fishermen. My name is Billy Causey, and I'm in the Florida Keys, and I've worked very closely with CCA sure. over the years, Ted Forsgren, and Carl Wickstrom, mm -hmm. the whole crew. But there seems to be, to me, a disjunct between CCA um, leadership at the top levels and CCA members rank and file on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that is that I just know so many people that want more fish, they want bigger fish, and some of the current measures are not getting us there. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the new practices? And that's where the, the debate and the discussion about no-take areas comes to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And I just think that we all want the same things, but it seems like we all have a different difference of opinion as to how to get there. And, and that's why debate's healthy, but, but I will say, and I, and I won't engage in a debate here, it would ruin everyone's lunch. Um, <laughs> but, but to answer your question is that the question I would pose back is, are we better enhancing recreational opportunities? Are we not gonna end up with healthier fisheries? Would we have a robust red drum stock in the Gulf of Mexico? if it wasn't for recreational fishermen? I, I think those answers are clear. And would you have a gillnet ban in the Columbia River right now if it wasn't for recreational anglers? So what we need to do as a community 
is enhance opportunities for recreational angling. Now, are there times that rec recreational anglers need to be managed more? Of course. Uh, we've been the first ones to say, you know what, we support reductions. Um, think of what we've done recently. Look at some of the efforts that Texas Parks and Wildlife are doing with speckled trout, and we're supporting going to half the limit. And there's not even clear evidence that the stock's in any trouble. That's the kind of group you want more of, not less of. Just, just one last word, Larry. <laughs> well, you know, hey, the good hey, thing is, hey. actually, I get the last word, okay. so go ahead. Okay, okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, the, the Tortugas Ecological Reserve, which is one of the, the United States' largest fully protected areas, has seen a huge increase in numbers of fish. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's really clear right now in the Florida Keys, Riley's Hump is a spawning aggregation site for mutton snapper. Four years in a row, they had record landings of mutton snapper throughout the Keys. Even recreational fishermen are now starting to point to the reserves as being the reason why they're catching more mutton snapper. And we've watched the spawning aggregation site come back from dozens of fish to thousands of fish once again. So I just think we could work together, and we worked with recreational fishermen to cite that, and commercial sure. fishermen. So I think there's ways, rather than just take it off the table, I think I would like to see us open our minds to new tools to get there together. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I, 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 we're always, we've never been one to blunt a discussion. Um, but I just, the bigger picture to me in the health of these critical resources is looking for opportunities of how we can enhance more participation, good participation, and do the things that will bring the right stewards into the resource. And the simple fact is, it will show that through history, the greatest stewards to these resources have been recreational anglers. So with that, appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group. Um, appreciate the opportunity to debate. I love that. Um, and Larry, thank you for inviting me.